Hello and welcome to a new video about contour engineering. This time we are going to, to put our controls into categories. Okay. We, named, we know now what controlling is, we named a lot of stuff in controlling and now we are going to categorize them. Okay. This, is, this is the goal of this video, to find some, some categories simply how we could distinguish between different controller types. Yeah, we said, because we said, you know, we have to select a controller type. Yeah. Now, let's, let's see. This was our picture of control engineering. This was the control loop and so on. Yeah. So we're talking about this controller here, this regulator controller. Well, one possible distinguishing between different types of controllers is because of their construction. Yeah. So there's a construction. And basically we can differ between you know electronic controllers and and the others, mechanical, hydraulic, pneumatic controllers. So there are electronic controllers. And there are then mechanic hydraulic and pneumatic controllers. This is simply the way how they work. Eh? So if if this here, if the controller is working just with pressures of air pressures, then it's a pneumatic controller. If it's working because of some rotation or some forces and so on, then it's a mechanic controller. And if it's working with oil and pressures and so on, then it's a hydraulic controller. All right. Electronic controllers are uh, are working with electrical signals. That's it. Electrical controllers. Well, there are not really electric controllers because we will see we need to do something with this stuff and with electric components, with maybe also electric mechanic components. It is not that easy. Yeah? So we need electronics for this. Before the era of electronics, all controllers were mechanical, hydraulic, or pneumatic. Okay. So this is a way of distinguishing the construction. Yeah. Then we can talk about the function. We can talk about the function. Basically, there are two different types of controllers. Yeah. We have to look here at the correcting variable. We really have to look hard at the electric uh, of the correcting variable. This control variable, this is always a continuous variable always. So this is, this is the physical value I want to influence. It can be measured and I can measure in temperature. I can measure, measure 22.1 and 22.2 and can measure even 22.15 and every value in between. So this is a continuous variable. Okay. However, here the correcting variable, this NAS does not need to be continuous. If it is continuous, so if it can have any value between a minimum and a maximum value and anything in between, yeah, then it's a continuous controller. Okay. If it can only have discrete values, yeah, most simple example is turn on or turn off. Yeah. If, the, if the temperature is too low, turn on the heater. If the temperature is then too high, turn off the heater. So then it's only two discrete values, heat or not. Yeah? Then this is a, a switching, a switching controller, yeah? because it switches between discrete values. Yeah? Or if maybe the heater has several steps, 0, 1, 2, 3, and it switches through those steps, it's also a switching or discrete controller. Okay? So this, these are the two things. Yeah? So there is 
continuous yeah? and on one side, on the other side it's switching. Switching controllers. And we always have to look at the correcting variable. Yeah? Correcting variable. Yeah? Look at correcting variable. Yeah? And also here look at correcting variable. Yeah? Switching. Here the correcting variable is switched. And in both cases, in both cases, we can have with or without auxiliary power. Okay. So here you can have with or without. auxiliary power does not really matter and also in this case in this case we can also have with or without auxiliary power what does it mean with or without auxiliary power let's come back to this huh? We're talking about auxiliary power for our controller here. If this controller deviation, difference controller deviation, has enough power to already form a correcting variable, which is strong enough to influence the controlled variable, then I do not need additional power here. So if I can take the controller difference, just use it however this is built yeah, and can influence with exactly this the control system I do not need if I do not need to to amplify to gain it here I do not need extra power okay however if this is small uh, just tiny and for sure not strong enough to move something or something like this then I would need to amplify this signal and somehow deform it, yeah, somehow build with this signal the correcting variable. Yeah. Whenever I need to amplify here yeah, or twist the form of energy too much, yeah, then I need here additional power, then I need a plug on my controller. Yeah. I need to plug it in somewhere that this has additional power and can form the correcting variable in a way that it's strong enough to influence the control variable. This is, this is true in both elements, in continuous and in switching elements. So it really is about how powerful is the controller difference. How powerful is this? How powerful can that be? There is one, there's, I mean, the energy has to come from somewhere. Okay? The energy has to come from somewhere. Even if the controller is without auxiliary power, the energy to influence the system is coming from the controlled variable, from where else, yeah? maybe from the reference variable, yeah? but it's taken from the system simply. Yeah? This means the controller itself is already a disturbance to the system, because if the controller wasn't, would not be there, it would not drain this amount of energy from the controlled variable. Yeah? So this is actually, I mean, the good thing is I don't need extra power, so I can build it somewhere, simply somewhere. Yeah? The bad thing is that I'm draining power of my control system and I need to somehow already, the controller needs to correct himself, it's, it's self-influence yeah, without it, auxiliary power. If it has auxiliary power, the impact on the control system is usually smaller from the controller side. So this is with or without auxiliary power. Talking about functions. Let's make a short example. Let's make a short example. Something like this. There's a rotating shaft. There's a shaft. 
which is rotating. Because it's mounted to a machine and it wants to control the speed of the machine. Then here I could mount two weights. So if there's a mass, there's also a mass. The faster this is turning, the more force this mass will have centrifugal forces. If it's in standstill, the mass will go down. If it's starting to turn, the mass will slowly go up. Yeah, so we will move here. And the faster it's turning, the more outside these masses will be. Hmm? Simply because of the centrifugal forces. And this movement of the masses I can use by simply, well simply, by, by adding here also some rods to these masses. Here also rods to, a, to another shaft, yeah, which is somehow around this inner rotating shaft. Yeah? And if those two masses now go outside, this will then be moved up and down. If they go outside, this will be moved up. If they go down, it will be moved down. Okay? And this movement here of this, I could use to, to adjust the throttle valve. Yeah? So if the speed is too high, I will move up. If I move up, I close a little bit the throttle valve and the speed will adjust itself and limit itself at a certain point. Yeah? So this is a speed regulator. If the speed is too low, then this will drop, the throttle valve is open and it will speed up. Yeah? This is a typical speed regulator. Yeah? Also in, in, in steam machines and so on, they were used. Yeah? So this is a typical example of a mechanical. Yeah? So this is a mechanical construction, no doubt about this. Since the position of the, of the masses can be somewhere simply, yeah? it's not discrete values, it can be everywhere, it's continuous. It is a continuous mechanical controller. And now, do we need extra power to control it? No. It's without auxiliary power, because we simply take the energy from the rotating shaft to move, to adjust the throttle valve. A typical example of a mechanical continuous controller without auxiliary power. So this would also be a way to distinguish. And then there is the possibility to distinguish between the way of signal processing. So process red processing. Because actually they are analog. And there are digital governors. Where is the difference now? Analog, digital. Uh, in analog governance, everything inside the governor or the controller, sometimes say governor because I'm coming out of the field of turbine controlling, water turbine controlling, and there it's called turbine governor. So, controller. Uh, if everything inside the controller is working in an analog matter, yeah. Then it's an analog controller. <laughs> Good joke, right? What means analog? Analog means there is an input. This input is somehow processed in the controller by different parts. Yeah. Maybe like here, maybe like here, with some levers or something like this. Maybe there are gears inside or maybe there are just some electronic components with operational amplifiers, which do deform this controller different signals. So they just deform it. Yeah? They transform it, they deform it, they add something, they subtract something, they multiply or whatever. Yeah? Due to some movement of levers or, or charges or discharges of capacitors, uh, whatever. 
yeah? but it's analog. This means if this is high, whatever is working inside there is doing exactly the same in an analog matter and analog to the input, the output is changed. Yeah? Anything in between is changed immediately. If that input is changed, this analog network there is immediately changing the correcting variable. Analog processing. Then we have digital processing. Digital processing means this controller here is working digital. This means with numbers. Yeah? So this means the control deviation is here at the input of the controller. It is digitized, transferred into a number. It is no longer a signal, it's just a number. Yeah? And with this number, the controller can calculate by using a multiplication, subtraction, whatever. Mathematics is a wild field. You can really think of a lot of stuff you could do with a number. Yeah? And then the result of this, all those calculations is a new correcting variable. Then it will be output of a new correcting variable. The output will also be a number. This will then be with a digital analog converter converted into an analog signal again and this will influence the control system. Okay. Since the digital part, yeah, this is very usual right now. Yeah. Well, the, the analog, analog controllers, you can find them most likely in the museum, yeah. but in the field it's really hard to find them meanwhile. Yeah. So you will not get in contact with the, uh, with the analog controller, I assume, or rarely. Yeah. The majority of the controllers are digital, simply because it's much easier to calculate with numbers. You can do whatever you think, yeah? it's more flexible. But I also mention now a major, a major downside. Yeah? This digitalization here, the controller deviation, we make a snapshot. Yeah? We make a, out of the signal, we make a number. This happens. Uh, and then we take this number, do some calculation, this takes some time, and then we have an output value, and then this output value is influencing the control system. This time we need to, between taking the snapshot and calculating, and taking the snaps, next snapshot and calculating again, so we are, only, we are only working with snapshots of the reality. So we only know at exactly one discrete moment in time how it looked like and with this we are working if now the cycle time of the of the controller and so on is too low yeah, and so I take too few snapshots this might lead to instability because I'm working with a snapshot of the past and the reality already changed a little bit and this is already too much and I'm reacting the wrong way. Okay. So this might lead to instability, to work with the snapshots, and digital controllers do work with snapshots. There is no way around it. They have cycle times. Analog controllers do not have this issue. If an analog controller, this is changing, this is changing. Analog. Digital controllers, We need a little bit of time. However, you know, with nowadays power, calculation power, even in the tiniest part, uh, this disadvantage is usually not that big anymore. Uh, but sometimes you may run into this issue. Uh, if you're not taking care about cycle times in some PLCs or something like this, which is then working as controller, you might run into the issue that you have instability simply because you're, you're processing too few snapshots of the reality in your digital controller. So these are the ways on how we can distinguish controllers. Next time we're going to dig into this 
controller theory. Yeah? One big part is the so-called transfer element. Okay, transfer element. I already mentioned this once. Yeah? So an analog uh, controller, I said, is taking this, is transferring, manipulating this, and their output is a result of the input. Yeah? And this is exactly a transfer element. What we can do with transfer elements and how they look like, we can then see in next video. Yeah? For this time, thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.